Hello, everybody. On this Monday, June 20th, I'm Spencer Mazik, and this is the Bloomberg Law Podcast, a series of interviews focusing on trends in the busy legal profession. In recent years, the oil and gas industry has revamped a drilling technique called hydraulic fracturing or fracking to unlock natural gas reserves trapped underground. These reserves could supply the U.S. with gas for up to 100 years. So why are some folks calling for a ban on fracking? Joining us to discuss the risks and regulation of fracking is Elizabeth Burleson, a Pace Law School professor. Welcome, Professor Burleson. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Sure. Well, so, Professor, tell me, is there a significant amount of natural gas trapped underground in the U.S.? Yes. There's roughly um, as much traditional as uh, non-traditional natural gas. And again, it's not going to last forever, but uh, it's being described lately as a transition fuel. If we're going to try and get off of some of the uh, traditional forms of fossil fuels that um, cause, uh, you know, the greenhouse uh, gas mitigation well, do we have a sense of where the gas is located and which states? Well, you've got a Barnet Shale in the Texas area. You have a Marcellus Shale that runs along the Appalachian Range, and uh, extraction's already occurring in, in places like uh, in Pennsylvania. And then you have in New York um, a moratorium and efforts to try and make sure that there's some regulation for uh, groundwater. One of the ways to obtain this gas is through a process called hydraulic fracturing or fracking, as it's commonly called. What is fracking? Fracking. So it's um, it's interesting because it, for the uh, industry uh, they tend to use phrasing as the, as their their shorthand and opponents tend to use fracking and, mm. and proper terminology is <laughs> hydraulic yeah, fracturing. I, yeah, um, I didn't know that. So it, it, and, and people are writing both and the media has tended to lean towards fracking. So it is in fact common terminology to say fracking, but they um, it, it's primarily water and then uh, sand and then some fluids that help keep the sand suspended and um, lubricate. What are the chemicals used in fracking then? Um, so there's a, a potential range of, of over 700 uh, and generally not nearly that many are used at any one time. But it's also really important to keep in mind that each location is really specific. It's shale, but it's a different sort of shale. So what works in one location May might not, not necessarily work. work in another. Yeah. yeah, so when you're talking fracking fluid or freezing fluid or hydraulic fracturing fluid, you're not necessarily talking about the exact same thing that's being used in, say, Ohio versus New York versus Pennsylvania versus Alabama versus, um, you know, Texas or or now in, in the UK, um, Israel, uh, you know, th all the different places that, that are starting to look at this. And it is, in fact, um, a, a lucrative thing to have sorted out what works best in one location. So the, the companies arguably have a, a vested interest not to share right, that Right, and keeping that protected, it's almost like a trade secret. And I know that a colleague of yours, Hannah Wiseman, actually wrote an article that I read about them using, the, saying that the chemicals that they use in the process is a trade secret. So can you explain a little bit yeah, more about and, that? Yeah, and Han Professor Hannah Wiseman's done um, both in Fordham and, and Columbia and uh, Villanova several whole series of articles that really speak well to this conflict between trying to meet the needs of um, you know, uh, environmental integrity as well as public health, because even when you get workers that come to emergency rooms, nurses are now getting exposed to acid levels and they don't know what they're working with. On the other hand, in intellectual property, um, companies deserve to be able to protect uh, their trade secrets. I want to get to what everyone's been talking about, which is the risks of hydraulic fracturing. Does it pose a real threat to our air and water supply? So you have um, methane leakage, which you know the Cornell uh, study talked about greenhouse gas. You know, using that as the frame, you've you've got methane leakage being of greater concern than um, bringing down carbon levels. So in that context, you're you're impacting atmospheric. Um, uh, so, it, greenhouse gas climate change um, numbers. In in the in the Duke study, you were talking about the the fact that 
methane was getting into drinking water, and it wasn't clear how. It wasn't necessarily the fracking solution. Um, diesel wasn't necessarily getting into the drinking water, but the methane was. And I read so, that study because they said that gas could transport in the gas phase um, from the shale formations to the groundwater. And they thought perhaps it's coming up partially through natural fissures and then combined. That was one possibility, but it was by far um, more likely that the natural gas was getting in the in the groundwater and, and then in the drinking water uh, in locations directly around these um, hydraulic factoring sites. Which so that's up, well, I want to hate to interrupt, but it brings yeah. up an interesting point to me because I don't know whether or not you've seen this film, but it's an Oscar-nominated documentary called Gasland Gas by Josh Fox, and in it there's this famous image of uh, one of yes, exactly one of the uh, folks who live near one of the fracking sites actually is lighting water on fire. So, so I, he turns on his water tap and he literally gets a ball of fire coming out of his kitchen sink. Yeah, and I know and you're not a scientist, but is it likely due to the methane contamination? They're, they're getting the very strong sense that it's methane. Um, one of the things that New York is, is trying to do in terms of regulations is make sure that they have both before and after uh, understanding. And so in the locations where this has occurred, there hasn't necessarily been a sufficient understanding of what did what were the methane levels before this fracking um, or hydraulic factoring started. And so, yes, it seems likely, it seems highly likely, but there isn't, uh, in, in environmental law generally, it, you don't always have a good baseline to, to, to know what you, you are starting with. But in addition to that, one of the most important aspects of the risk um, is, is the risk to depletion of groundwater levels um, and the risk of what's being done with the wastewater. And right now you're getting wastewater taken to ordinary sewage treatment plants that, that don't have the means mm. by which to try and filter or, or you know, properly uh, deal with the wastewater. Is it regulated on a federal level? You hinted at some states that are regulating it, but is it regulated on a fe federal level? So arguably it ought to be under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And it's not because an, a waiver um, of the provision of 1421 uh, in in the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, the the uh, Energy Act of 05 created a waiver, and so our 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 provisions, our environmental provisions that um, that try and regulate this type of activity, uh, don't necessarily do to do so as comprehensively as they might, and that's why people are arguing that they should. Um, Re-establish that uh, fracking solutions should fall under the underground injection program in the Safe Drinking Water Act, and perhaps also the hazardous waste under RICRA, which was in the in '88, also um, uh, in, uh, taken out. Yeah, that so was dubbed in the media actually as the Halliburton loophole or exemption. And I, you know, I think it's interesting that. Uh, do we know the rationale behind this amendment? Do we, because I also understand that the Clearwater Act was amended, but do we have any sense as to well, what the, Congress was the thinking? The Energy Act of 05 clearly had national security and, and, and you know, home uh, energy it, it, as, as its predominant theme. The, the, yet throughout federal law, we, we believe firmly in uh, human health and, and welfare and, and protecting environments as well. So how to balance that properly, you've got uh, a really interesting situation right now with the Delaware um, Water Basin Commission um, being a federal entity. It, it gets federal funding and it gets, um, it, it, it's has uh, Army Corps of Engineer involvement, and you've just very recently had the state of New York suing, because the state of New York now has this moratorium, but the Delaware uh, Water Basin Commission may well uh, start regulating, and the state of New York wants to make sure that those regulations are done in a manner that follows NEPA, and that's another one of our federal environmental statutes. Well, so there seems to be some so, federal regulation, and then it sounds like you're saying yeah. that the states are also regulating fracking. And I have to mention that on Friday, uh, Texas Governor Rick Perry signed into law so a bill that law. will require companies to make public the chemicals they use on fracking jobs in the state of Texas. And so that's it a certainly partial is partial disclosure law. That's not a full disclosure law because it leaves open um, the trade secret that we discussed earlier and that Hannah's written on that you need to, uh, it's, a, it's a balance. It's, it's probably going further than most states have, but you, do, you and they are posting to a site called um, uh, Frac, 
if if you go to uh, okay, so I'm forgetting the exact yeah, URL. Yeah, and the name's not it, relevant, but, but I think we get the point here. But, but they're I not wanted posting to ask you, all the chemicals. I wanted they're to posting. ask you: Do you think that there's any process of the fracking, any part of the fracking process that isn't regulated that probably should be? Um, I think there arguably needs to be a disclosure of the fracking chemicals so that people know what the risk exposure is. And at present, we don't have a scientific basis. So the National Academy of Sciences ought to be doing a full uh, study on hydraulic fracturing so that we then have cradle to grave analysis on the aspects of not just um, the hydraulic fracturing, but the drilling, the the casement issue with the cement, um, how stable that process is, are the drilling solutions um, escaping the leakage of the methane um, and, and the wastewater? And can you actually find ways to make the hydraulic fracturing solutions less toxic, use, use more benign chemicals? Or uh, additionally, how can you try and make it less water intensive? And so when you, you know, energy is very water intensive and water is very energy intensive. Um, but in this context, we're talking about something that might make sense in the context of bringing down carbon, but is going to have a lot of other implications, and particularly the radioactivity aspect of it, which isn't in the fracking solutions per se, but is coming back up in the wastewater, is something that isn't currently being uh, studied. So New York's um, got its moratorium until it finishes the process of its revised supplemental generic environmental impact statement, and that's open for public comment, and it probably won't come out until at least the fall at the earliest. But the scope of the, the um, studies that are being conducted both at the EPA level federally and at the state level aren't necessarily looking broadly enough at beyond the, the, the hydraulic fracturing fluids themselves and the chemicals in those fluids. Okay. Well, and if regulated, then, should uh, we as a culture, as a society, embrace hydraulic fracturing? If sufficiently regulated, I see this happening. Um, you know, I think communities uh, should be able to use information that's put in the public domain that clearly identifies the range of chemicals being used and that buffer zones should be put around public uh, drinking supplies, aquifers. Um, you know, just we should have a very, very comprehensive, we should not be permitting beyond our capacity to monitor. And we should be doing water quality uh, uh, tests both before and after downstream ongoing tests and yes that's all going to cost money so it needs to be funded properly this is going to be a very lucrative field um, that is simply going to ramp up uh, a, a, a substantial part of Chesapeake is is uh, is Chinese investment, you're getting many international players in both as investors and the stakeholders have asked for disclosure, not all of them, but there are stakeholders that have asked for disclosure. Um, so corporate responsibility in the form of knowing what those chemicals are uh, and corporate responsibility in terms of having best practices. And I think we should raise up the best practices and the best companies and highlight what is working well so that the other companies can start using these best practices. All right, well, unfortunately, we're running out of time, so we're gonna have to leave it there, but it sounds like whether or not fracking, you know, we embrace it, it's gonna be here to stay, but thank you very much for sharing your insight with us today. We greatly appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much. When we come back, our spotlight on contributed content. We'll be back in a moment. Digital technology has transformed the way we live our lives. We can access any piece of information at any time from anywhere. We can share ideas with thousands of people instantly. Staying up to date with breaking news and events is easier now than ever before. All this lets us keep pace with the world in real time. Yet, have any of these innovations been applied to the way we research and practice law? Starting today, the answer is yes. Welcome to Bloomberg Law the first and only real-time research system for the 21st century legal practice. Created by the leading provider of data and information services. A single search feature with access to legal, news, and company databases provides you with powerful legal research results and a holistic view of your clients. Filtered so you know the information you receive will be relevant every time. Customizable legal, financial, and news alerts keep you ahead of your clients and in tune with their world. An integrated workspace allows you to organize your results by client, by urgency, by topic, however you want it, and to share those results with people on your team. 
Log in now to experience Bloomberg Law. Now it's time for our spotlight on contributed content. This is a segment where we highlight an article that was featured in one of our Bloomberg Law reports. Today's article comes to us from Glenn Berger, Cheryl Foley, and Alexander Cook of Skadden Arps. The title of the article is Electric Transmission, The Feds Are Here to Help. In the article, the authors discuss recent efforts by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to encourage the development of new electric transmission. This is a great article, and you can find it in the June 13th issue of our Bloomberg Law Reports, Technology Law, on the terminal at btlrgo or at bloomberglaw.com. Articles are contributed to us for publication by practitioners, law professors, and other legal experts. To find out more about how you can contribute, please visit bloomberglaw.com. Thank you to the Skadden attorneys for that contributed piece. And again, our thanks to Professor Elizabeth Burleson of Pace Law School. Bye, everybody. Yeah.